And so I would like to welcome you, you all to the fourth lecture of the 24th annual Lefevre Winter Series on Aging. As you know, I'm your host, I'm Elena Volpi, and I direct the City Center on Aging. And this lecture series honors the uh, memory of Dr. Edward James Lefevre. Um, he was uh, essentially the physician who started geriatric medicine on the island. And uh, in, uh, in, the, in 1939, or down those, uh, that, that, that kind of time, and he taught internal medicine at UTMB, and later became the director of the Turners and Moody's um, House, which is now the Meridian Retirement Community. Um, and before he died, UTMB actually developed the uh, geriatric division, which has been um, very strong ever since the development. So today I'm really happy to uh, introduce a friend, Dr. Cynthia Brown. She is the director of the division uh, uh, of the Division of Gerontology, Geriatrics, and Palliative Care the director of the uh, Comprehensive Center for Healthy Aging, a professor and vice chair for faculty and staff de development in the Department of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And she's also the medical director of the Birmingham Atlanta VA Grac Fall Prevention and Mobility Clinic. Dr. Brown has a very interesting um, academic history because she received first a bachelor's degree in physical therapy and actually was a, a licensed physical therapist from East Carolina University and then went on to get a medical degree um, from the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and then she got a master's degree in public health, uh, clinical research and health behavior from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She did her um, residency training in internal medicine and the fellowship in geriatrics at uh, Yale, uh, Yale University. And after the fellowship, she uh, was hired as an assistant professor at University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she's been ever since, becoming the full professor and uh, director that she's today. Her research focuses on mobility-related issues, uh, um, including falls in hospitalized geriatric patients, which is an area of great importance for recovery and independence of older adults. She's been the principal investigator or the co-principal investigators of a number of grants funded by the NIH and the VA, um, and also by HRSA. Um, she's the PI of the. Uh, she's been the PI of the HERS of the um, Geriatric Education uh, Center, which we used to have here too. Um, she has published more than 80 peer-reviewed papers and 14 book chapters. Uh, Dr. Brown has been uh, in the editorial board of several scientific journals and has served as a reviewer and the chair of NIH study sections. Uh, she's been recently elected as the chair of the health sciences section of the Gerontological Society of America, which is a very important uh, uh, position within that society. Uh, she has received many honors and awards, among which the American Geriatric Society Outstanding Scientific Achievement for Clinical Investigation Award and uh, is listed as uh, in Best Doctors uh, uh, in America. Dr. Brown has also mentored a number of successful students, fellows, and junior faculty, and I'm really happy to host her today um, uh, as the speaker for the 24th Lefebvre Winter Series on Aging, and the title of her talk is Creating a Culture of Hospital Mobility for Older Adults. So, Dr. Cynthia Brown, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There we go. Moving on. Um, so we have a lot of objectives, and I'm going to move on. Um, what I like to do is let me do my talking, and then I am open for questions, adore questions, uh, so we can go from there. And I wanted to start by talking about the scope of the problem. And the problem that I'm talking about is hospital mobility or lack thereof. So. The first thing that I have to paint a picture about is um, what I call the early years. Um, before 2005, we actually had really limited methods for measuring hospital mobility. 
And I know that's hard to believe when every single you know, person you see is wearing a Fitbit and knows you know, exactly how many steps they've taken in the last 24 hours or haven't taken if you spent your day in meetings. Um, but back in the day, uh, not that long ago, we had things like um, people did chart reviews for physician activity orders or there were literally brief surveys of patient location where an investigator would walk down the hall and go, in the bed, in the chair. That's how we knew what people were doing. Or we use nurse report for what's going on, and we've learned a lot about nursing report about mobility, um, but that's what we had. And then lastly, there was a study that actually did direct observation in the hallway, where they had an investigator sit in the hallway and just document the proportion of people that came out into the hallway to walk. Well, we know that's not very many, right? So in, in 2009, um, we published the first paper using accelerometers, and I don't want you to laugh, but this is the accelerometer that we used. It literally was beta testing. Um, it gave a stream of numbers that we actually had to make sure it synced up. And we attached them to the thigh and the ankle. And don't worry, that's not a real patient. That's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is what we did. But what we found is that low mobility, which we defined as bed rest or bed to chair activity, because I am a PT, so it doesn't count if you sit up in the chair, um, that 83% of the hospital stay was spent lying in the bed. And that roughly 43 minutes per day was actually spent standing or walking. And those results have been duplicated multiple times. The second time was actually here at UTMB, um, and y'all got close. You were 57, Steve? 57 minutes um, on the feet. Um, it also has been duplicated in Israel and um, in Denmark. And what this shows you here is what we found hour by hour, that this is the lying part, and there's a whole lot of lying going on. This is the sitting. You can see spikes probably for meals. We don't know that for sure. And then down here, this line that like doesn't do a whole lot of anything, that was the mobility. So the question becomes, why isn't it happening? So clearly it's not happening, but why was it not happening? So my mentor, Dr. Allman, at the time made me come up with a model. I'm a doctor. I hate models. If I was a nurse, I'd be much better at this because nurses are really good at thinking about models. But I put together this idea that there were a number of reasons why people wouldn't be up on their feet during the hospital stay. So you can see patient-related factors. They're sick. They don't really want to get up. Maybe they have a lot of comorbid illness or they have altered mental status. They're delirious. Next was treatment-related factors. So we put things onto and into people that make it so that they may not want to be mobile. There might be institution-related factors, so staffing patterns and lack of ambulatory devices on the units. And then lastly are the attitudinal factors. So people come in and they think that they're at the Hilton and breakfast, lunch, and dinner get served in bed, and nobody wants to get up. So maybe that was the problem. So we did a qualitative study where we interviewed patients, nurses, and their physicians. And I'm going to share with you a couple of the quotes that, um, that we got. The first was from a patient who said, I don't believe they're going to get me out of bed while I'm here. If I said I really needed to get out of bed, they try to do what you want them to do, but evidently they don't think that it's important. And a nurse said, we try and encourage the doctors to order physical therapy because we don't have time to ambulate the patients in the hallway like the doctor expects. And lastly was the doctor, who this is my favorite quote that I got during this whole experience. I think it's just that patients, when they're in the hospital, they feel they're supposed to be in bed, and they're more comfortable there. And a lot of times, they can see the TV better. <laughs> and that always gets a chuckle. And yet, 
where's the television in the room? Right over the bed. And you got a remote. You don't got to go nowhere. You can just click away and life is good, right? But it promotes the lack of mobility. So this semi-structured interview that we did, uh, we asked patients about barriers. And these are the things that we found. And let me orient you that the black bar are the patients, striped bar is what the nurses said, and this sort of grayish bar is what the physicians said. So you can see that weakness, pain, so symptoms were mentioned by a lot of people. Medical reasons for not getting up out of bed um, were also mentioned quite a bit. Falls were huge. And in fact, every single physician mentioned falls, which is interesting. Um, this was done pre-2008 when CMS made falls a never event. I bet you every nurse would talk about it now. Um, catheters and IVs were mentioned, again, more by the health professionals than by the, um, the patients, but they definitely were mentioned by everybody. Lack of staff, and then lack of assistive devices. You'll notice that the nurses really focused on the fact that they didn't have the equipment that they needed in order to be able to walk the patient. I also find it interesting that no doctor mentioned lack of equipment because they're pretty clueless that we don't have equipment. And then lastly is lack of patient motivation. And notice that no patient said that they lacked motivation. So it was all the healthcare providers that talked about the fact that, that the patients lacked motivation. And in fact, what the patient said was, if somebody told me this was important, I would do it. But I didn't know it was important. So maybe this doesn't matter. In fact, I had someone, um, God love them, uh, who reviewed a grant for me early on. And this was an internist, um, prominent person, who actually said, well, I don't know why this is such a big deal. I mean, they're only in the hospital, what, three, five days? How could this make any difference? Why are you going after this as your K? This doesn't make sense. So I want to share and make sure you know why this is important. We knew that a lot of the geriatric syn syndromes that we deal with actually are related to bed rest and low mobility. And this is my favorite slide. Anybody who does mobility work uses this slide. This was developed my, by Morton Creditor um, back in the 90s. Um, fascinatingly, everything leads to the nursing home. I'd argue that death is probably on that list. Um, but what he talked about in this particular paper was that all of this stuff up here happens as we age. So decrease in muscle strength and aerobic capacity, changes in skin, uh, changes in your ventilation. So that all happens as we age. But then we bring you into the hospital and we do stuff to you. So we don't um, tie you down, but we give you a Foley catheter, which has been termed a one-point restraint because people don't move when they have a catheter. Uh, and you can see all of the consequences like delirium, falls, syncope, and the like. So interestingly, there were review papers um, when I first got interested in this topic, but there wasn't any actual evidence around mobility, which is still kind of fascinating to me. Um, and the students and I talked a bit about serendipity um, earlier today, that this was just, this dropped in my lap. So I have a career because it dropped in my lap. Um, the first thing that we looked at was the prevalence and the outcome. So is this actually common? And does it have adverse outcomes? And this data comes from Sharon Inouye's uh, data set that was done for delirium. Um, so I didn't have to get all those patients. It was a lot easier using my mentors than having to get my own data, I can tell you. So we uh, had 498 hospitalized older adults. And I created a mobility scale that was based on nurse report, because that's all we had. 
And it was based on the degree of assistance that someone needed to get out of bed and move and the number of times that they transferred and ambulated. And then we split that up into three, low, intermediate, and high mobility, and then decided, um, looked at these outcomes. So functional decline, any ADL decrease, new institutionalization at discharge, death, and the combined death or new institutionalization. So those were the outcomes that we wanted to see whether mobility made any difference. And you can see in the low mobility group right here that people had a 5.6 times higher odds of having ADL decline than the people who were in the high mobility group. And interestingly, the same is true in terms of there was a graded response where the intermediate mobility people also had higher odds of uh, having ADL decline compared to the high mobility group. And in and of itself, that might not be a big deal, but down here you can see that we adjusted for all the things that might explain the fact that these people were not doing as well. So we looked at what were their ADLs before, demographics, their Apache 2, which gives us a sense of illness severity, their comorbidity scale, whether or not they went to the ICU or the CCU. So as well as we could, we were able to adjust for a lot of the things that might tell us that that's the reason, not low mobility. So it really did, for the first time, highlight the fact that low mobility was a big deal and that this was something that we ought to pay attention to. There have been a few other studies, um, and this is just one that I want to share with you. Um, it is not my work. Um, it's Dr. Cordobian's work, um, but it's super important. And in this study, what they did was put um, healthy older adults to bed uh, for 10 days, and they were not allowed to walk at all. In fact, to get to the bathroom, they were put in a wheelchair, they were rolled into the bathroom, they did their business, they were rolled back and put right, right back to bed. There are some days when I think that 10 days of bed rest would be really awesome, um, but this study really highlights why bed rest is such a big deal. And you can see that in terms of, um, these were the different tests that were done. Um, and this is what people look like before bed rest, after bed rest, and percent change. And I'm always struck by the percent change here in lower extremity lean mass. So what they observed was a 6.3 decrease, percent decrease, in lean muscle mass of the lower extremities after being on bed rest for 10 days. So if you've got an 80-year-old who's barely hanging on to independence, and you put them to bed, even for that three to five days um, that I was questioned about, it's going to have an impact on their function. And that's the reason this is so important. It's also beyond functional decline. And we've been talking about life space, so a little life space coming up here. Um, we did a, had a study, study of aging one, um, that recruited a thousand subjects. They were stratified. Uh, it was a random sample of Medicare beneficiaries that lived in five counties in central Alabama. So just to orient, Jefferson County is where UAB is. Tuscaloosa is where the good football team is. And then these three counties are extremely rural counties. So this is where all these people came from. They oversampled males, African Americans, and rural residents, so that there was a balanced sample. And they were asked life space questions, and this is life space. So what life space does is asks you in the past four weeks, have you left the room where you sleep? Have you gotten out of your home to your porch, your garage? Have you gotten out um, of your yard? Have you gotten into your neighborhood, into your town, or out of town? And not only have you done it, how frequently have you done it, and do you need help from another person to do that, or did you need help from equipment? And you end up with a score that ranges from zero to 120, and 
Somewhere around 60 is the break point. If you're below 60, then you actually have limitations of your life space and there are adverse consequences associated with that. So what we did was looked at this data on 211 folks who had been hospitalized, um, or there were 211 hospitalizations among 687 participants over a four year time period. 44 were surgical admissions, and those were um, open heart surgery, hip fracture surgery, total knee, total knee, hip, that kind of thing. And these folks had life space done every six months. And then we used a multi-change model. I used we, it wasn't me, I had nothing to do with it. The biostatistician who was really good, he's the one that did this model to determine the trajectory of life space before and after hospitalization. And this is what we found. So again, let me orient you. Um, this is a consolidation of all the data. So there's no one individual, but all of the people become points on this line. And so this is before the hospitalization. And you can see that the surgery people who were in green are a little bit better in terms of their life space, but not dramatically better. And the blue line are the medicine people, people who went in for a medical admission. And then there was the hospitalization. And for surgery, they had a 23 point decline in their life space, which is massive. We know that five points is the minimally clinically important difference. So 23 points is catastrophic. I mean, that's a huge decline. But over time, you can see that they recovered and actually got better than we would have projected them to be. But importantly, the medicine people dropped about 10 points and essentially never recovered. So clearly, this isn't just a functional decline, having to go to the nursing home. There's a lot more involved in this, in what's going on in our hospitals. So there are some tested interventions, and I'm only going to talk about a few, just to give you a flavor. But the important thing for you to know is in terms of randomized controlled trials, we're not doing very well. We have not got a lot of evidence that's true randomized controlled trial. Um, a lot of what we've done is observational studies. Um, we have data from people who have um, followed people before and after a hospitalization, and they've shared their data, um, but not a whole lot of in the hospital randomized control trials. So an area for people who are interested. Um, so out of bed protocols, there was one study that looked at transporters and got them to do the walking during quiet periods. So that tended to be late afternoon, evening, or on weekends, which was great, because that's when nobody else is around. So um, they found that it was feasible, but they actually never did anything more than demonstrated feasibility. There was another um, study that looked at a nurse-driven protocol of progressive ambulation. Uh, and these were all patients who came in with community-acquired pneumonia. And unfortunately, they were very focused on 30-day readmission and did everybody get their antibiotics on time, and they actually did nothing with regard to functional outcomes. And this is one of the few randomized controlled trials of a progressive ambulation program. Uh, there was a study done um, by a <clears throat> nurse investigator out of Wisconsin, um, Dr. Barbara King, uh, and she has looked at getting, uh, using a nurse-driven intervention. Uh, and these are the things that she is focused on. So they had five components um, and included things like increasing self-efficacy of the nurses to actually do the ambulation. Because one of the things she's found is that the nurses feel pretty uncomfortable with walking patients. It's not something they spend a lot of time in nursing school learning. They have a whole lot of other stuff to learn. Um, and so many of them were not comfortable with that. Uh, they used whiteboards for information sharing. Um, and many of us are doing similar things where we do check marks if people have walked. Uh, they actually created interesting pathways 
Um, so this is something we've done on our ACE unit as well. Uh, there are pictures, there are things that are interesting. Um, if I got to come look at the ocean, not that I can see it right now, I know it's out there somewhere, but you know, having a hospital where literally that's the view, that is gonna encourage people to get up and walk because they can see the ocean. Uh, ambulation resources, again, it goes back to that equipment thing. If we don't have the equipment we need, then people are not gonna get up. Um, and then lastly was to establish nurse ownership um, over uh, patient ambulation. Um, and I will share my thoughts on that a little later. But um, again, this was not a randomized control trial. This was a pre-post uh, sort of thing. But you can see that in terms of the total distance ambulated, um, their trajectory was definitely better. And clearly, they documented more what was going on. Um, and they have been able to sustain this um, fairly well at the institution where um, Dr. King is. So, we um, did a randomized control trial at um, our Birmingham VA, and we recruited 100 patients. Importantly, they were not demented, not delirious, able to walk in the two weeks before they came into the hospital. So this was a, I don't want to use the term healthy, because that's not what they are, but, but they were um, certainly more likely to um, get up and walk with us. And they were either assigned to the mobility program or to usual care. And we had assessments that were done by blinded assessors. And then we did one month telephone follow up of these folks. And the other group that was blinded as best we could were the physicians. So we didn't tell them what we were recruiting for. We just got them to say it would be OK if their patient walked. Um, but they didn't know what we were doing because we didn't want them to do anything different with regard to their orders, particularly PT orders. And these are the kinds of things that we did. So everybody got twice daily some kind of visit. Um, for the mobility folks, they actually walked twice a day. For the usual care, it was twice daily friendly visits. Um, in Alabama, that means we talked about football. Um, and we talk about football all year round, so it doesn't matter what season it is, it's football season. Uh, the mobility program, if they could use the rolling walker safely, they got one left in their room. Uh, they were, everybody was given a folder, and in the folder for the mobility program, we actually documented goals that the patients had, um, and they were asked to actually keep track of how much sitting and walking they did Whereas in the usual care, uh, we documented little friendly messages, and their job was to track the number of visitors that came to see them. So again, just trying to mimic what was going on in the two groups. And then lastly, there was daily motivational interviewing that focused on goals and barriers to mobility. And this was the group. Um, and I think the things that I like to highlight, they look pretty similar. There was no statistically significant difference. Um, what you will see is length of stay wise. The walking <coughs> program was in a little longer. Median was not a problem. Uh, reason for that is that of the um, 100 patients, four went to the intensive care unit, and they were all in the mobility group. But it wasn't my fault. I didn't send them there. Um, but that just goes to show you that randomization is only so good. Um, what was important about this study was it was the first to use mobility techs um, to do the actual ambulation. We showed that it was feasible and safe. We did have three in-hospital falls but they were all in the control group. So you know I did a happy dance at the end of this study that there were no falls in the intervention group. We didn't see any change in activities of daily living, but what we did see was community mobility, which is measured by life space, was maintained in the mobility program group, and there was a 10-point decline in the control group. And what's really fascinating to me about that is that that's the t same 10-point decline that we saw looking at study of aging. 
So there is something going on in the hospital that is causing people to lose their life space. And we haven't figured out what it is yet, but we're working on it. And this just shows you that in, at baseline, the numbers were fairly close um, and that there's definitely a difference post-hospitalization. So we're thinking about moving towards more pragmatic trials, so from a um, research perspective. Um, but one of the things that we face, once again, is the fact that we can't put step watches on every patient <laughs> that comes into the hospital. So if we want to do a big hospital-wide study, I can't have a step watch on them all. It, it's just not feasible to do that. Um, and so we've been thinking quite a lot about, well, how do, we, how do we measure what's going on in the hospital without accelerometers? Um, there is uh, one assessment that has been done. Um, it's the John Hopkins Highest Level of Mobility Scale, um, which actually asks the nurses, so it's very funny that we're going back full circle. We're back to asking the nurses, um, what do the patients do? And the answers range from they were on bed rest, they sat in the chair, they walked in the room, they walked in the hallway, um, and then they walked 250 feet or more. And that's supposed to be done every shift um, is the way it was developed. Um, so we thought, well, maybe, maybe just relying on the nurses isn't necessarily the best. Um, and maybe we could get more data out of patients if we asked the patients to report on what they were doing. So what we did was developed a um, self-reported mobility assessment. And I think you're going to see similarities to what I told you about in my very first um, foray into trying to measure mobility. Uh, because the scale grew out of that very clearly. So we recruited cognitively intact, hospitalized older adults. They were 65 and older. They were able to walk before they came in because we actually wanted them to be active. That was actually a goal. We consented 63, um, but 12 of them weren't used in our analysis. Um, 10 of them, it's because we actually couldn't get 24 hours worth of uh, step watch data because they were out the door so fast that we didn't get that. Um, and then we had two patients who transferred to the ICU, um, so we weren't able to continue to work with them. But all of these folks wore a step watch, so an accelerometer, for 24 hours. And then we came back the next day, took off the step watch, and asked them um, a, a series of questions. And these are the things that we went after. So um, from the patients, we gathered their life space assessment, what we're calling the acute care mobility assessment uh, score, and I'll share with you in a minute that, um, and then self-identified gender, race, ethnicity. The nurses at our institution actually track the CATS index. It's actually part of our medical record, uh, and that's done before admission, whatever it was, pre-admission, and then current. They also were doing the John Hopkins scale, uh, and then they're doing a nursing delirium scale. And then we uh, got information on medical comorbidities for the Charlson. Used a Spearman correlation coefficient to compare steps and time uh, between the step watch, the acute care mobility assessment tool, and the John Hopkins highest level of mobility scale. And this is the acute care mobility assessment. And so basically it's, did you get out of the bed, walk in the room, walk in the hall, walk off the unit. Um, the only people that I see do this are my patients at the VA when they're going to the smoking hut. So that's the only time we get any mobility off the unit. Um, the answer is a yes, no, and then there's frequency that ranges from once to greater than four times. We asked about help from another person and use of special equipments. Um, I'm going to ditch that um, because it doesn't seem to matter. 
And these are the baseline characteristics of these patients. And this has not yet been published. In fact, I have the manuscript because I have to get it done because um, I keep sharing it and people want to use it. So I'm working on it. Um, but you can see we had a really nice um, representation of folks who self-identified as African American. Um, and you can see their CAT score before admission and at study entry uh, were still pretty good. Uh, steps taken, around 660 um, was the mean with a standard deviation of 662. So based on Steve's paper, we might be in trouble because 900 um, is kind of a magic number and we're not doing so well. Um, the Johns Hopkins highest level of mobility score was a uh, six. Um, and what that means is in the room. So lots of in the room stuff going on. So this is the proportion of patients that achieved each of the levels. Um, and you can see that everybody sat in a chair. And you can see that they sit in the chair quite a bit. So that's encouraging, they're not staying in the bed. Everybody in this population walked in the room, um, and they walked in the room quite a bit. About half of them actually did walk in the hallway, and you can see that it was mostly one time. Um, it gets sparse as we get further out. Um, and six patients walked off the unit total, um, and I don't know what they were doing because this was at UAB and we don't have a smoking hut. Um, so they must have been wandering around for looking for a, a nice sunset or something. So we did the Spearman correlation and looked at a number of different ways to score this. Um, and what was most highly correlated was when we used the walked in the room, walked in the hall, walked off the unit numbers without worrying about did they need an ambulatory device, did they need help from another person. So the nice part about that is that that really simplifies this because now you literally could use this uh, tool to quickly check with people every 24 hours as to what they've done without having to ask too many questions. It literally will be a yes, no for each of those three levels and then a frequency data. And you can see that the correlation with um, number of steps and the ACMA was 0.84. Total time was 0.67. Um, and there is a correlation between the Hopkins mobility scale and the ACMA. Uh, it also allowed us to look at the Johns Hopkins highest level of mobility, um, which they actually haven't done. Um, they've used it other ways. Um, so it also was correlated with steps and time walking. So what's exciting is that that tells us that we actually have some potential tools if we want to go to that pragmatic level to really do work um, at a hospital system level. So the good part is that this was done in a population of folks with all sorts of diseases. It's not limited to one disease. This is geriatrics. We got to do it all. Um, we have great representation of both men and women as well as African Americans um, and whites. But we don't have other race and ethnicities because we don't have that in Alabama. Um, our minority population besides African Americans is less than 1%. Um, so if you had a Hispanic population that you wanted to test this in, this might be good. Um, it's super easy to complete. My folks were able to do it in three minutes or less, even with chatty patients, so that's important. Um, but limitations-wise, you have to be cognitively intact enough to be able to remember what you did over the 24 hours. And obviously, we prompted people and told them, we're going to be asking you about what you did so that they were going to be more in tune. So I'm sure that helped. Um, but if they're demented or delirious, this isn't going to be very effective. Um, it isn't a perfect correlation, but if I put up a perfect correlation, you'd figure I was lying. Um, and in, thus far, it's not tied to outcomes. So we haven't been able to do anything yet with it um, that showed that it was able to predict or do anything like that, um, but that is coming. 
So ultimately what my goal with this hospital mobility work is to actually change the hospital culture. Um, so that is my pie in the sky that, you know, when I leave this earth, that hospitals are not going to be run the way they're currently run. Um, that may be pie in the sky. But um, we know that in order to get culture change around mobility, that for any culture change to occur, that there's a couple of things that have to happen. So first, everybody has to be able to articulate what we're trying to do. The second is they have to understand the why. So I think all of the work that I've done before that shows bad outcomes that are associated with this, that show the high prevalence of immobility, are all things that, that need to be shared with the team in order to get the team on board. And then lastly, we have to be able to define the roles of the team members, which is a challenge. So in terms of thinking about the barriers specifically to culture change around hospital mobility, the first is the, the ownership of this is completely unclear. So if you ask the nurses who's responsible for mobility, they talk about PT, and PTs are like, ah, you're killing me, right? I can't see every patient. Uh, the hospital culture itself encourages low mobility. The hospital environment encourages low mobility. And finally, healthcare policy encourages low mobility. So let's chat about these. So here's the, the ownership. Um, there are too few P PTs to walk every hospitalized patient, right? And oh, by the way, it's not a skilled need. And what we're supposed to be doing as physical therapists is doing something that requires our DPT degree. Walking a patient does not require that. Gait training requires that. But walking patients absolutely does not need a physical therapist. <coughs> Nursing. There was a time when nurses walked patients and gave back rubs. That would be the 50s, right? Nursing has changed tremendously over the past 50 odd years. So they don't have the time to be walking our patients. Um, documentation has completely out of, gotten out of control. And they're spending a lot of their day with documentation just like all the rest of us. <coughs> the other I've already mentioned is that many of them report that they don't feel very comfortable walking patients, that that's not something that they learn in depth the way physical therapists do. And so that may not be something that they feel like they can do. So what about the family? One, we have to educate them. We have to train them because God forbid they fall when they're walking somebody. That would be a crisis. But the other is that we have to educate them that it's okay to walk, right? Because we've all got into this idea that we're supposed to be in bed when we're in the hospital. So this is a culture change for families and for patients as well. What about using volunteers? So the Hospital Elder Life Program uh, that was developed by Sharon Inouye uses volunteers to do a lot of the things that we're talking about. Um, we have some experience with this on our ACE unit where we do have volunteers, particularly OT and PT students, uh, folks who want to go to medical school. They come and volunteer. But it's difficult to get the attorneys on board with that because, again, they're worried that someone's going to fall and there'll be liability, and so that creates a, a challenge. And then lastly, we heard about a study where they use transporters. So maybe we could use transporters. They actually are paid by the institution. They're trained in transfers. That might be an option. Um, but they have a lot of other job responsibilities, and so it makes it difficult to pull them away to do the walking that's necessary. So we got to figure out who owns this. Now, I mentioned that the environment encourages low mobility. This has not been well studied at all. 
Um, there is some interest around this, but this has not been well studied. But again, the television is right there, and I got a channel turner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner comes in but into my room. I don't have to get up. Even if I do get up, I mean, how ugly is that? Like, why would I want to get out? That is so sterile and ugly. And oh, by the way, check out the gown y'all make me wear, right? So who wants to go out in the hallway with your hiney hanging out? And oh, probably you have a Foley catheter. And like, yuck, like I'm not going out. It's not going to happen. So just to encourage you that there is interest in this area, um, there was actually a 2017 Environment for Aging conference. Um, and one of the things that they actually talked about was how do we think about geriatric hospital rooms? And what are the things that we could do differently that would help encourage people to be mobile? So the things they have here, um, these are actually markers so that you know how far you've gone. And I hear you've got markers at your new ACE unit, so that's awesome. They've put up pretty pictures. They don't have a beautiful um, seaside like y'all do, but you know they've got pictures. They've created labyrinths, so people can come and walk in the labyrinth. Um, and they are using boards and the like. In case you can't read it, this says, swing dancing only, no tango yet as the activity for this particular patient. So there is an interest in creating an environment that more promotes mobility. And then lastly is my soapbox. Um, I get on this soapbox on a regular basis, um, and that's around the global policies that encourage low mobility. So um, CMS created uh, NEVER events and these are events that are never supposed to happen. And because they are never supposed to happen, there are consequences, monetary consequences, to those <coughs> things. And unfortunately, one of the things that they put on that list was falls. So if you have a fall with an injury, um, that will not be paid for by Medicare. Now, that sounds pretty simple. I don't know about y'all, but we actually only have about four Sentinel events per year where it's a really bad something that happens to patients. But we have 60 to 90 falls per month. But mostly they're without any injury, et cetera. The problem is that hospitals have responded to this never event idea with very robust fall prevention um, programs, um, mostly that are, most of which are around, you know, call before you fall, but I'm really busy, so don't call me, you know, because I have 4,000 million other things I'm supposed to do. Um, there's lots of patient education around fall prevention and don't get out of the bed. Um, people are identified as fall risks, and now we've got bed alarms on practically everybody because we are scared to death that they're going to fall and have a significant injury. That's a problem. So one potential solution is to actually change the focus um, from fall prevention to safe mobility. So we take the onus off fall prevention, which has become a shame and blame um, to the nurses. It's, it, the nurses are labeled. Um, if their patient falls, they get in trouble, which is just ridiculous. Um, the AGS actually published a white paper uh, that recommended mobility as a quality improvement measure. Uh, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation have actually targeted 300 plus hospitals with mobility programs. There's online support for it. And then lastly, the John A. Hartford Foundation has developed um, an age-friendly health system initiative. They want 20% of hospitals to be age-friendly by 2020. So pretty aggressive. Uh, they have four M's that they're going after. I can always remember three, but never the fourth. But the one that matters is mobility. So that's actually made it to the list, um, which is really exciting because they are going to be pushing uh, mobility uh, across our hospital systems. We actually have a mobility initiative that we've started, and again, this is my, I'm trying to get pragmatic and trying to get culture change. Um, we did uh, in-services for unit champions around mobility 
Uh, we gave them tools for auditing because they were our boots on the ground. Uh, we taught them through case study on how to address barriers with their peers. Um, and then the unit champions were to provide feedback and coaching uh, to the other unit staff to, again, try and encourage uh, hospital mobility. And this is just the training uh, timeline. So there was staff education. There was train the trainer kinds of stuff focused on coaching. There was unit coaching by the trainers and champions. And then uh, sustaining was the, the last goal. Um, and this was a 46-day mobility tech pilot. And you can see that they screened a boatload of patients. Um, about half of them were eligible. And know that these were not professionals. They were patient care technicians who were taught by the physical therapist. Um, these are the reasons. This, uh, this is what they came up with. So if they were on contact isolation, the nurse said, no way. Uh, they had a high fall risk score. And the one thing that they told me they would have changed about this was they would have eliminated the high risk fall score. Um, or if their cats was too low, um, that they probably hadn't been walking before. Uh, and this is what they did with them. So you can see that quite a number of them actually got out of the room and did at least a lap around the hospital ward. So. My take-home points for you are our patients are still spending a significant amount of their hospital stay lying in bed. And there's a lot of barriers, but many of them are actually modifiable. And that we have shown that mobility programs are feasible, they are safe, they're efficacious, um, but we have got to change hospital culture. Uh, in order for us to integrate hospital mobility as just standard of care. It's what we do. And with that, I will stop and take questions. <laughs> so, um, agree, the important piece is that we actually controlled for or adjusted for the fact that they had whatever chronic illnesses they had. So we were able to adjust for that using statistics. And in spite of that, those people still had a decline and, and didn't get better. So, because um, I agree with you. If, if you've got a lot of chronic illness, we know that that's a, a challenge. So does that make sense? OK. I found this very interesting, this uh, changing the culture, because as everything would have to change, you have to change the culture, whatever it is, and even people who are sick, you know, they are sick different in different cultures, which in mm -hmm. the literature exists in this topic. But, you know, one thing that's always amazing, uh, when you teach uh, students, to point out how would you feel just when we put you into the gap, you know, it's mm -hmm. just changing your, your, your uh, appearance, it's, it's very... Uh, important kind of putting us up and then down. So maybe even giving permission to the patients to do something about the gown, maybe not at the moment when they have so many things going on, mm -hmm. but you know, saying after maybe afternoon, many times it's the time when they may be more uh, eager to change this mm -hmm. clothing and, and be like they are normally. They think a feeling that they are not really all the time in this gown, right? If you are at seven. But you have this permission, you know, to, to change. Wear something else. And yeah. the other thing which, which you mentioned was about uh, kind of pictures and, you know, I, I saw on the, uh, uh, one of the conferences, they are, more, they are putting the skies in the ceilings, which mm -hmm. actually is imitating for the brain. The brain doesn't know the difference that the sky is real, kind of it's real sky. So mm -hmm. that's an excellent thing that you're in the new hospital, so probably. <laughs> yeah, too late for this one, but. <laughs> we had actually in the nursing home events, uh, which I think are possible to implement in the hospital, like the volunteers from the community coming and playing just for 30 minutes some kind of instrument. Yes. So the patients are, and I was seeing, you know, like really they start to get out, they want to come, they want mm -hmm. to listen to this little 
you know, something. Whatever's going on. With it, yes. Like this. So there are small things, I think, which we can almost immediately implement. I totally agree with you. Absolutely. We have something called Move and Groove on our ACE unit. And it's volunteers who come in and play, and everybody comes down to the conference area, and they actually will get up and dance. It's really fun. <laughs> so, yes? Just back to your thoughts on this. I know you don't have a lot of Latino populations in Nope. <laughs> but we do have a lot of Latino population. And uh, one of the things we notice is uh, we tend to have a lot of families and friends and visitors mm -hmm. coming to be with them. And we are think we, we are we are thinking of looking at that, the density of visitors visiting seniors in their room mm -hmm. and whether there is any relationship to the mobility. Mm -hmm. In your study, did you, I know you didn't collect information on the number of mm -hmm. visitors, but I just wonder whether you, you notice anything. Several questions about contact isolations, which right, which is surgical right. patients versus the medical patients. Mm -hmm. Because I'm speculating that there may be more contact isolations medical people yeah, versus, probably, versus somebody coming for a mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's an intriguing thought. Um, and the question is, are those family encouraging mobility or discouraging? Because it could go either way. Uh, so it may be that there are, that that would be a place where you could do an intervention that was family education and then see whether having a large density of people who are all saying, mommy, you need to get up, whether that actually makes a difference. Because I would worry that there, there may be different messages than, than what you think. So, Hi. yes, hey. I have um, perhaps a thought that's not a very well thought out question, but one of the things I think we are noticing, at least in our environment, is there's an increasing use of other mobility aids not walkers, not canes, not even wheelchairs, but I'm thinking of things like queer lifts and Sarah studies and other pieces of equipment that perhaps get patients out of bed. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure what they really are doing for mobility. And I, 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 I see that there's benefit in trouble support and things like that, managing transfers, but I'm curious if you have a thought on how other types of equipment have either helped or hindered cultural mobility. Mm -hmm. and related to that, one of the other caveats we have, and, and one of our nurse educators here, and she knows exactly what I'm about to say, is that we give these folks with the Sarah study or the Brain Lift to a chair, for instance, and then we tend to leave them there. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about the risk of perhaps too much time. In the chair. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Not walking, but um, maybe Absolutely. So um, the key is, what is the goal? Um, if the goal is that you have a patient who you would physically not be able to transfer, then a Hoyer totally makes sense because it does change their environment a bit. Um, it allows them to sit more upright than the bed does. But of course, what we oftentimes do is we put them into the recliner and then we recline them. <clears throat> so we've just lost the improvement in ventilation, et cetera, that we gain by having them sit up. Um, I think we're using these devices more because it's, again, the fall prevention piece. We've gotten afraid to stand people up and actually do a stand pivot transfer. And yet, the weight bearing is what we need. It's why, in all of my work, sitting just doesn't count because you're not really doing anything, particularly because what most patients do is sit in a chair and then lean back. And so there's not even trunk control that's happening. Um, if they were sitting on the side of the bed, it would actually be better for them from a having to, to actually use their core, um, which they're not using. So I think that we have gotten into the habit of doing this. Um, it also goes to the fact that many nurses are not comfortable with transfers and part of this is that they're afraid they're going to hurt themselves and they're right i mean that's the other thing is that that we see workman's comp injuries related to transfers because people don't know exactly how to do it um, and they don't have the same training that a physical therapist does 
I can still transfer a 250 pound quadriplegic by myself. I can still do it, but it's because I know how to do it. I know how to position myself. I, I know what to do. And that's not something that folks are taught. So until we give people the training and the confidence, I think that it at least allows patients to get a different viewpoint of the room that they're stuck in. So, you know, maybe that has benefit if they sit up. I think it's good from a ventilation perfusion perspective. Um, but I totally agree with you about the, we leave them up too long. And we talk about it as if you, we're building your endurance. No, we're just tearing, wearing you out and we're gonna end up giving you a decubitus in a different place because the chairs are not designed to have somebody sitting there for a prolonged period of time. So, so we really ought to be rethinking what we're doing with Hoyer lifts and, and the chair itself. So. so thank you so much. Now the good news is we have wine, so. Yay! UTMB Health, working together to work wonders. <laughs>